to start whenever there is a discussion of programming. You cannot approach the concepts in isolation because there are a multitude of variables involved. For how many exercises per muscle group? That of course ties into your exercise selection, which ties into your training split, which ties into your training frequency, which ties into your periodization. And I cannot conceivably cover every issue related to this question in a video, but I'm anticipating that you will connect the dots with your own training. And of course, and importantly, adapt and apply the information to yourself. And so my goal with these videos is not to sell you a workout program, not to sell you anything, and for sure not to tell you what you must do. And importantly, I cannot give you the exact number for every muscle group, that would be nonsense, because you all have different needs. But what I can do is present information to you to help guide your decision making. And so I actually very recently showed this quote from Dr. Schoenfeld, but it perfectly underpins the way we can approach this question. Exercises should be varied in a multi-planar, multi-angled fashion to ensure maximal stimulation of all muscle fibers. The idea of hitting a muscle group from multiple angles is of course valid and would therefore dictate that more than one exercise per muscle group would be beneficial. And so why is this? Well, different movement patterns can work different parts of a muscle group and also activate different muscle fibers due to the directional nature of muscle fibers. And we have planes of motion that can guide us here, hence the term multiplanar, multiplanar, who knows? And so let's take two simple examples. First, the pectoral muscles, AKA the chest. And so let's think about movement patterns which require the involvement of the pectoral muscle group. And then simply those movements can be trained with resistance to increase the size of that muscle group in a balanced manner, simple. A horizontal press through the sagittal plane. Exercises that work this movement pattern include the bench press, the push up. You all know this, this is standard application. A horizontal adduction. We have, for example, the chest fly. We have the coracoid process, including the coracobrachialis, which I can hardly say, I think it's got a C in it somewhere. Now, this is actually a common misinterpretation of this exercise where people will say, well, the chest fly will give you a greater stretch on the pec major. It's not actually the pec major, it's the coracobrachialis, a very small muscle that people are feeling with that extra stretch. And so, of course, when you think about this horizontal adduction, you may want to perform these movements on the floor for long-term shoulder health. And you may also mix movement patterns, for example, a cable press followed by adduction in a crossover manner for a very strong peak contraction. And then you have small variations of movement patterns, for example, the incline press, which hits that upper chest more. Perhaps certain parts of a muscle group are lagging or weaker, and you just want more emphasis on that. And so the deltoid group are a great visual example of this. Of course, the military press, a great compound exercise, which works multiple deltoid muscles. But then you have the front raise, of course, which will have more emphasis on the anterior deltoid, the side lateral raise, more emphasis on the medial deltoid, that problem middle child. And then you have, for example, face pulls, which put the emphasis on the rear deltoid. And in addition, with exercise variations, you can perform the same movement, but in a different way to change the strength curve of an exercise. For example, when you perform the lateral raise to hit that medial delt, the exercise will feel the hardest towards the mid range of that lift. However, if you perform a lean away lateral raise, the same movement, but performed in a slightly different way, it's gonna feel harder towards the top end range of motion of that exercise. And if you perform a low cable lateral raise, it's gonna feel harder towards the start of that exercise. So go and try Try that today, perform that exercise in those three different ways and see where it feels harder for you. But having said all that, it doesn't mean that somebody performing just one compound exercise per muscle group cannot grow muscle. Of course it can. And so very simply, but importantly, when you think about movement patterns and muscle groups, that in order to create effective muscle growth for multiple areas of a muscle group, more than one exercise, of course, would be advantageous. And this was seen in, for example, Fonseca et al, which involved 49 people split into five groups. There were four experimental groups and one control group, which was a very interesting design. And here are the different groups, but I know looking at these terms, it may be confusing, so I just want to keep it simple. And essentially, this paper found that overall muscle growth was similar between groups, regardless of the variety of exercises used for the quadricep muscle. However, the two of the four groups that used more exercise variation experienced hypertrophy at all sites in the quadricep muscle, whereas the two consistent exercise groups, less variation, did not see muscle growth in the vastus medialis and rectus femoris. And so very interestingly, this supports the idea that working a muscle group from multiple angles with multiple exercises can initiate muscle growth in more parts of that muscle, perhaps this more holistic, 
balanced muscle growth, if you like. And then we also have Costa et al, which involved 22 detrained men, detrained perhaps not the best sample group. And this one was simple. One group had varied exercises, one group didn't. And they trained three times a week for nine weeks. And so volume and intensity were equated for the two groups. But again, the group that had the varied exercises experienced muscle growth in all sites of those muscle groups. Whereas the group that didn't vary the exercises didn't experience muscle growth in all measured sites of a muscle group. And in addition, change equals adaptation. So at the heart of that principle, if you are just performing one exercise per muscle group, let's say the flat barbell bench press, a great compound exercise, overload methods over time would become harder to achieve. Of course, you can increase the weight, you can change your reps, your sets, etc. but you are limiting your potential for further stimulus, for further overload methods, if you use just one exercise, for example. And in addition, it can just be boring to perhaps use one exercise or just two exercises for a certain muscle group over a long amount of time. And those intangible factors, feeling excited about your training is also absolutely valid. But we need to be careful here. And so here's the other side of the coin. What I've presented to you is the idea that a variation of exercises, certainly more than one, is advantageous for effective muscle growth to achieve muscle growth at all sites of a muscle group. However, that doesn't mean that you change your exercise every session or you change your exercises every week, for example. The idea of consistently hammering at an exercise and progressing that over time is absolutely vital. And so the interpretation here with this question is to use common sense and find a balance and to not be too extreme at either end of the spectrum, which then leads to this statement that I will make. Doing, for example, six, seven, eight exercises per muscle group in a week is at an extreme end of the spectrum, perhaps too many and not an efficient use of your time. And perhaps you can think of that as a, a point of diminishing returns. However, doing just one exercise per muscle group at the other end of that spectrum, again, limiting your potential, limiting the, the variation of, of multi-planet exercises, for example. And so a good answer, and perhaps with most fitness concepts, lies somewhere in between. And of course, importantly, using compound exercises, which involve multiple muscle groups, multiple joints are fantastic because they give you a great amount of bang for your buck. So when it comes to, for example, the bicep exercise, do you need to do seven to eight different variations of bicep exercise to target every single part of the bicep group multiple times? No, but most certainly doing a few variations to, and consciously targeting different parts of the muscle from different angles is logical. For example, a hammer curl can include the brachioradialis and also incorporates the brachialis muscle. And then you have, for example, an incline bicep curl, which can target the long head of the bicep, for example. And so the point is, don't suffer from paralysis by analysis, but do approach your training with an understanding of anatomy. You may do around three or four exercises per muscle group per week. That seems a decent number. But again, I'm not telling you what you must do. I'm presenting information, presenting a spectrum here, presenting a range and giving the reasons. And you have to adapt to yourself. Many people watching this will perform around three to four exercises, perhaps per muscle group per week. And that would be valid. And as always, please apply to yourself. So please give me your thoughts. Let me know how many exercises you do per muscle group per week, because your input adds value to the video. It, it's constructive in terms of the discussion for concepts and where we can all learn. I'm James Linker, Shredder Sports Science. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you soon.